Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1220 Calculus 2 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual today, I am your professor, Dr. Andrew Misseldein. Uh, this lecture represents the first part of lecture 17 in our series, uh, for which we're going to get started in section 7.7 .7 of James Stewart's calculus textbook and talk about uh, when should we approximate the area under the curve. Uh, so to kind of further explain this idea, as we mentioned in the previous, uh, the previous video, not all integrals actually can be evaluated exactly. Um, and this is actually because the antiderivative is maybe too difficult or actually impossible to calculate. Uh, that is to say, there are many elementary functions which have non-elementary antiderivatives. That is, there's no way to describe the antiderivative using just the operations of algebra, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, composition, um, and, the, and the standard function families like power functions, uh, transcendental functions like sine, cosine, trigonometry, hyperbolics, exponentials, logarithms, their inverses. Uh, the type of functions we talk about all the time in calculus, uh, these are what we call the elementary functions, and there are many functions whose antiderivatives are non-elementary. Uh, sort of like a poster child in this regard is if you take the integral of e to the x squared dx. Uh, this function cannot, we can't find an elementary antiderivative, but it turns out if we stick a negative sign in here, modifications to this function are actually are very important for probability as one studies normal distributions and such. So we're still interested in finding the error into the curve, uh, but it can be difficult to do so if we can't use the fundamental theorem of calculus. But the thing is, people often conflate the integrals with FTC. That is, we spend so many time, so much time finding antiderivatives to help us calculate integrals that we sometimes forget that integrals themselves are not antiderivatives. It's the area under the curve, and that area could be calculated in another way. Uh, and so in this section, I want to introduce to you methods we can use to approximate the area under the curve, because honestly, an approximation to a sufficient level of precision uh, will be just as good uh, than some exact answer, right? So in order to talk about how we're going to approximate integrals, we want to return to the definition of the integral, the definite integral again, right? And so the idea we have is the following. We have our x-axis. Ooh, that's really, really going wrong way there. Take our x-axis and our y-axis, like so. And we have some function f. We'll say it's a continuous function. We get something like this. And we're interested in finding the area of under, uh, under the curve between two points, A and B. So our strategy for trying to find the area under this continuous function from A to B is we begin by subdividing the interval into n many equal width subintervals. So we get like x1, x2, x3, x4, all the way up till the end. And we want each of these things to be equal equidistant. Right, so each of these little tick marks is x delta x distance away from each other. And so we've seen many times in the past, delta x, because it's uniform in its width, would be b minus a, which if you take that, it's the whole length of the interval, and you divide it by n, the number of subdivisions we took. All right, so each, each sub-interval here has, has, a, uh, has a width of delta x. And these little markers, we can give names, x1, x2, x3, uh, continue on. Somewhere in the middle, we're going to have some xi. Its predecessor would be xi minus 1. And then we continue on until we get to b. b is, of course, just xn. And a, we can think of as x0. It's the one that precedes the first one there. All right. And so then, to find the area under the curve, we take our intervals we created with all these little tick marks, and we're going to form a rectangle associated to each interval, right? The width of the rectangle will be the width of the interval, subinterval, which is delta x. The height of the height of the rectangle is determined by the height of the function. And so how we do this is we pick some representative, uh, which we might call xi star. Um, xi star shows up in the in, in the ith interval. It's between xi and xi minus one. The star represents that it's not necessarily xi itself. It's some delegate we choose to represent the height of the rectangle because the height of the rectangle will decide 
to be f of xi star. So we take our delegate, we plug it into the function, and that determines how tall the rectangle will be. Now the length of a rect or the area of a rectangle is length times width. So its its length would be f of xi star, its width would be delta x. And so the product of these two gives us the area of a rectangle. As there are numerous rectangles, we add together all of these areas individually, and that will give us the area of all of these in rectangles. And as we've seen in the past, this Riemann sum, so this right here, our Riemann sum, uh, it calculates an approximate area of the under the curve, because we see that there's going to be situations where the rectangles maybe overlap. Uh, that is to say, they might go over the function, they may be underestimating. Um, and so we don't anticipate this to be a perfect calculation, just an estimate. Now, in Calculus 1, we've seen that these Riemann sums calculate the area of the curve. Uh, but we, and we've also seen that if you take more and more subdivisions, uh, you get better and better approximations. So you see these kind of rectangles in front of you right now. Of course, if we take even skinnier rectangles, right? they fit the curve much better than a thicker rectangle. So certainly by taking larger and larger n, the approximation will become closer and closer to the true value under the curve. Taking the limit, of course, which is what the integral is, then gives us um, the, the true area under the curve. But the thing is, we're in a situation where the limit uh, is too difficult for us to calculate, right? We can't use the fundamental theorem calculus. So how do we decide since we can't go towards infinity, we're going to have to stop after some finite number of steps. And so what sufficiently large n will work for us in our approximation to get us close enough to the true value? Another issue we're going to have to deal with is how do we know if our approximation is good enough if we don't know what the value is that we're trying to approximate? We'll come into that in a little bit. So we're going to have to choose some large n for our approximations to be reliable. But it also depends a lot on this choice of xi star. How we choose xi star does affect how quickly this approximation works. And so there's three choices of xi star that I want to talk about right here in this lecture here. And in many of these we've probably seen before. So the first one is commonly referred to as the, raw, the right endpoint rule, or it's denoted Rn for short. And in this situation, xi star is, to, is chosen simply just to be xi, which remember from the interval we saw before, xi, so if you're considering the second interval, like in this picture right here, xi is always the one on the right. So the second interval has on the right x2. The fourth interval right here has on its right x4. And that's why we get the name, the right endpoint rule. Um, xi star will just select the point on the right of the interval. So we get x1, x2, x3, x4 for the first, second, third, and fourth intervals respectively. Now it is helpful to have a formula for this xi star, which is simply just xi. The idea is that we start on the very most left spot, which is a. Uh, to get to x1, we take one step to the right, which that step has a thickness of delta x. To go to x2, we take a second step to the right, which also has a thickness of delta x. And then thirdly, we take another step if we want to get to x3. And so we just take a step to the right of delta x thickness every time we want to go down the line. And so xi will be start at a and take i steps to the right. That'll get you to xi. All right. And so then with this definition of xi star, we get the formula for the right endpoint rule. It's going to be a Riemann sum where we go from 1 to n. We have n number of rectangles. The height of your rectangle will be f of xi, the, the height of the function at that right endpoint, and then the thickness will be delta x, like we see right here. Um, you see in this illustration what it would look like to find the right-hand approximation of a function. Uh, this one has n equals 4. It's a continuous function right here. The height of the first interval right here is determined by this point on the right. The height of the second interval will be determined by the height at x2. The third interval's height will be determined at x3. And the fourth interval, the height will be determined by what's happening at, at f of x of 4, right? like so. Um, some things I want to point out about the right endpoint rules, of course, the height's always determined by the right endpoint. But look about the overlap and the underlap right here. 
Um, as we're going, like if you look at the interval, the first one from x0 to x1, you'll notice that the function was increasing. And because it's increasing, the right endpoint rule will actually overestimate the area under the curve. So the right endpoint rule always overestimates when you are increasing. On the other hand, if you go from x3 to x4, the function here is decreasing, it's going down. And as such, the right endpoint rule will underestimate, there's a gap right there, between uh, the, 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 the area under the curve. And so if your function has a lot of going ups and going downs, it turns out this potentially could average out, but this is a vulnerability of the right endpoint rule we wanna know. We can actually predict when it will overestimate, underestimate based upon the monotonicity of the function. Now related to the right endpoint rule is sort of its counterpoint, the left endpoint rule. The idea is basically the same. Um, if we are interested in the second interval right here, we actually choose the endpoint on the left to determine the height of the function. Uh, so this would tell us that x i star is actually selected to be x i minus one, right? Because again, each interval is gonna be labeled by the point on the right, this is x i, and hence the one on the other side, x i minus one, will be one less than the interval we're at right there. All right, now the way we compute x i minus one is it's just like how we did it for x i. Starting at a, we're gonna take i minus one steps to the right, and that'll get us to x i, uh, x I minus one. Uh, and therefore, the left point rule is determined as the Riemann sum, where we take the sum of f of x i star, in this case, x i star is x i minus one, and we get a delta x for the thickness of those things. Very similar to the right-hand rule. We can see in this graphic right here an illustration of such a thing. Uh, so for the first interval, we are gonna choose our point on the left, which is x zero. For the second interval, we choose x one to determine the height of the function. Uh, for the third interval, we're gonna choose x two to be the height of the function. And then finally, for the fourth interval, we choose x three. Uh, that is f of x3 to be the height of the function. So we're always looking at the left endpoint rule there. Now, in contrast to the right endpoint rule, the over and under estimates are actually different from inter because this is the exact same function we saw on the previous slide. As you go from x0 to x1, the function was increasing. It's going up, right? And you'll see here, because we choose the left endpoint rule, the uh, the func the the left point the left endpoint rule is going to underestimate the area under the curve when you're increasing. On the other hand, if we go from x3 to x4, right, the function is decreasing, it's going down, and therefore the left point rule is gonna overestimate the area under the curve. So it's the exact opposite of the right endpoint rule. Uh, when you're increasing, right, when you're increasing, your right rule, we saw earlier, and we'll talk about the left rule as well, the right rule is gonna overestimate and we see here that the left-hand rule is gonna underestimate. And similarly, when you're decreasing, you're going down, you'll see the opposite. The right-hand rule will underestimate and the left-hand rule is gonna overestimate these things. Uh, this actually is an exact uh, opposition of each other. Um, it turns out that the strengths of the right-hand rule are the weaknesses of the left-hand rule and vice versa. And so it turns out that when we combine these two strategies together, uh, that actually lead to a very fruitful uh, a very fruitful calculation. So, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, before we talk about uh, the so-called trapezoidal rule, let's look at a third option for a selecting xi star, uh, which we call the midpoint rule. The midpoint rule, xi st star, will be chosen as the number xi bar, uh, where xi bar, what we do is we're gonna take the right endpoint, xi, take the left endpoint, xi minus one, we add them together and divide by two. That is, we take the midpoint of xi and xi minus one. So as you see right here in our graphic, here is our point x3. I'm sorry, that should be, uh, uh, the, the, that, that should be, that should, uh, oh, I see what's going on here. That should be a three, that should be a two, that should be a one. Slight mislabeling on my graphic there, sorry about that. Uh, so this should be right here, x3. This right here should be x2. And so x3 bar is then the average of x3 and x2. And so it's this point in the middle right there. All right, let me erase those things. All right, well, I need to fix my typo right there. Again, this should be x4, x3, 
x2 bar and x1 bar. My apologies. And so xi bar is just the average. It's just the midpoint of our two endpoints. The reason we use a bar is this comes from statistics that uh, putting a bar over a variable typically means you're taking the arithmetic mean, aka the midpoint in the situation. Now be aware that to find xi bar, all you have to do is you just go to xi and then you take a half step backwards. Uh, that'll get you to the midpoint. Uh, that's a formula way of doing it. There are, of course, other ways of calculating these things as well. And so when you do the midpoint rule, notice that your Riemann sum will look like the other situations. And your xi star you take to be xi bar, take the midpoint. Um, and then, I mean, if in expanded form, you'll take the, the height at the midpoint for the first one, the second one, or what to the last one, times everything by delta x. You see it right there. And so all of these strategies, A, B, and C, we've seen so far, the right endpoint, the left endpoint, the midpoint rule, it's all the strategies decided by just picking a good choice of xi star. And we're going to see in a future video here that xi, uh, choosing xi bar to be your xi star is actually a pretty good choice. It's, it's going to be, in general, much more accurate than other selections of xi star. And why that is, it, wh wh why that is consider the function we had before, right? As you go from x0 to x1, we saw that the function was increasing. And notice what happened with the midpoint rule here. Part of the graph is actually overestimating. The first half was. But then the second half is underestimating. So one rectangle, even though it, it, since it over and underestimates at the same time, it kind of balances itself out. Um, it's not perfect. The overlap does appear bigger than the underlap, under, underlap there. But it does seem that there's a lot of uh, cancellation that happens there. And likewise, when the graph was decreasing from x, uh, x3 to x4, uh, it was going down like this. You'll see that to the left of the midpoint, it was underestimating, but to the right of the endpoint, it was overestimating. And that actually looks pretty, pretty close, so it averages out fairly well. And so we'll see that measurably, the midpoint rule is a very powerful rule uh, for approximating areas of the curve without a lot of calculations. Now, I alluded to this one earlier, and I want to make a mention to this as well, the so-called trapezoid rule. Uh, the trapezoidal rule uh, comes about by taking the average, not of xi and xi minus 1. We take the average of ln and rn. We take the result from the right-hand rule. We take the result from the left-hand rule, and we average them together. Because like I was saying, when the graph is, when the graph is increasing, uh, one of them is going to overestimate, and one's going to underestimate. If we average those, kind of like the midpoint rule, maybe that kind of balances each other out. Um, and so that's what we do with the trapezoidal rule. Now, to be aware, how, do, how does one do the right-hand rule? Remember, you're going to get delta x, and then you're going to times this by f of x1, f of x2, all the way down to f of xn. When it comes to the left-hand rule, you get delta x times, you're going to get f of x0 plus f of x1 all the way down to f of x in minus 1, like so. And so one thing I want to point out to you is that when you add these together, a lot of these terms are common, right? So f of, f of x1 will show up twice in this sum. f of x2 will show up twice in this sum. And this will all carry down until you get to f of x minus 1, which will show up twice in this term. Um, so all of these terms will show up twice with two exceptions. f of x0 will show up in the left rule, but it won't show up in the right rule. And f of xn, sorry about the penmanship there, you can't really read it very well. f of xn will also show up only once. And so if you keep track of these things, um, when you take the, the, the average of ln and rn, you're going to get 1 f of x0, 2 f of x1s, 2 of x of x2s, 2 of f of x3, 2 of f of x4 all the way down to 2 of f of xn minus 1 and you'll have a single a single f of xn right there so if you keep track of the coefficients it goes 1 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 like a ballerina down to 1 at the very end and so it's important to keep track of those things so you get this coefficient sequence 1 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 2 1 and that way you'll use every single indice you use what happens at x naught 1 2 3 all the way up to x and use every single one of them you put a coefficient in front of the bookends you put a 2 everywhere else and now calculate your um, trapezoidal rule you do have to also times by delta x um, but you're going to get a delta x over 2 
Um, the delta x is because both ln and rn are divisible by delta x. And then likewise, as we're taking average, we'll divide by two right there. Uh, so let me give you some explanation of why we call it the trapezoid rule. Well, the idea here is if we take, if we take the rectangle, the left le rectangle, we're gonna get this right here. You get this rectangle. If we take uh, the right-hand rule, we get this rectangle right here. And notice they're gonna overlap on the smaller of the two. Uh, in which case, then the difference, the, the difference is gonna be this green part you see above. Uh, and if we cut that in half, because the midpoint is gonna cut this in half, we're only gonna take half of that rectangle. And so geometrically what this does is this is the same thing as taking the trapezoid who has square roots at the bottom, right? So this is, they're not square roots, I'm sorry, right angles at the bottom. Uh, then the endpoints, the endpoints right here, we're gonna connect the left endpoint with the right endpoint. And you form this trapezoid, this right trapezoid, like so. And this trapezoid will have the area of the average of the left rule and the right rule. And so we're using secant lines essentially to approximate uh, the function. With the left rule and the right rule, we're basically approximating the function as a constant. The, C, the trapezoid rule is trying to approximate the function using secant lines, which actually improves its accuracy from a geometric point of view very, very much so. Um, before we start to think that necessarily the trapezoid rule is the, is the f best of all the rules out there, if we turn to the midpoint rule, remember, we have this picture right here. I want to convince you that the midpoint rule likewise uh, can be viewed as a trapezoidal rule, but a different type of trapezoid. So we can construct the midpoints using rectangles like we did here. But this picture to the bottom right I want to illustrate to you turns out as we can actually construct the trapezoid whose slant on the top is determined by the, by the tangent line at the midpoint right here. This is actually equivalent to the rectangles we see on the screen as well. Uh, because this rectangle associated to the midpoint rule you can see right here, highlighting it here in yellow. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the tangent line that goes through the midpoint and we're going to slice it, slice the line along that point. Because the midpoint uh, f of xi bar is the point of tangency, the tangent line will definitely go through that. It'll slice, it'll slice the rectangle. It'll then cut off some corner, which is a triangle. If we then move it over here, we then construct a trapezoid. It has the exact same area as the as the square, the rectangle we had before, but now this is the trapezoid associated to the tangent line. And as we've seen in the past, tangent lines are gonna be better approximations than uh, secant lines. And so if you redraw the trapezoid rule or the midpoint rule using these tangential trapezoids, we can see how, we can see how good this is at approximating the area into the curve. So I've talked about in this video, the general strategies we're gonna use, the left rule, the right rule, the midpoint rule, and the trapezoid rule. In calculus one, you talked a lot about the left and right endpoint rules. We're not gonna use them so much um, in calculus two because they are inferior to the midpoint rule and the trapezoid rule. Mostly introduce them as a reminder and also we find the trapezoid rule. We can find it from the left and right endpoints. But also like we saw before with the trapezoid rule, if you use the one, two, 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 two rule, uh, you can actually compute it directly without the left or right endpoint rules. So in the next video, I'll show you how to use these uh, trapezoid rule and midpoint rule to calculate error into the curve.